The meeting will be recorded this evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, the program for tonight is we're going to be going over uh, our Skagit Land Trust's work with uh, March Point Heronry and Great Blue Herons in general here in Skagit County. We're going to start things off with our board member and community science volunteer, Ann Winkus, and she's going to give us an overview of the community science uh, program, specifically at March Point, what we've been doing for the Great Blue Herons there at March Point. Then uh, our executive director, Molly Doran, is uh, going to take over and she's going to give a little bit of history of Herons here at March Point in, and in Skagit County and all the things that the trust has been doing over many years uh, to work on benefiting Herons here in Skagit County. And then she's going to share uh, about a new opportunity that we have to purchase and protect more of the March Point Heronry area. And then at the very end, we're going to open things up uh, to questions, discussion. Um, so I will be monitoring the chat throughout the uh, presentation, and I'll be trying to gather up your questions, answer any questions you might have in the chat if you're having any technical difficulties. Um, you should be able to see, uh, I think, the chat bar at the very bottom, if you hover around the very bottom of your screen, you should see a little thing that says chat. And if you um, double click on that, that should pop out a chat window for you. And um, then if I'll be able to monitor that throughout the program. But without any further ado, since it appears I think my slide has moved forward, I'm just gonna go ahead and turn things over to uh, Ann Winkus. Take it away, Ann. Well, thank you, Laura, and um, welcome everybody. It's wonderful that you're spending this very hot, almost summer evening with us. I put this photo on because I love it. It was taken some winters ago by Sue Ayler and it just always makes me smile. I thought I'd share it with all of you this evening, hoping it brings a smile to your faces too, as you think about March Point Herons. There are three components to Skagit Land Trust's March Point Heronry Community Science Program. Volunteers observe heron behaviors throughout the breeding nesting season at the March Point Heronry. As soon as possible after the young leave the nests and all the herons have departed from the heronry, volunteers enter the heronry and record and map which trees have been used to raise young that season. As you can see in this photo, those trees are easily identified by all the whitewash on the understory. That is a task those people who come to volunteer that day, those have to be people who don't mind stink and don't mind stinging nettles. In the late fall, early winter, when the deciduous trees have lost their leaves, volunteers count nests. I, along with Two other volunteers, Sue Ayler and Shirley Ho, have observed throughout the breeding and nesting season at March Point for the past three years. We observe at locations outside of the heronry as the March Point herons startle and flush, flying off their nests whenever someone approaches the heronry. Each site allows us to look at different aspects of life as a March Point Heron. We stand on the road um, below the Heronry, craning our necks, peering upward. That is not always a peaceful out in nature kind of experience. We observe from the gravel pullout across from T. Bailey. And we observe from the site of the March Point landfill. Observing can be tough, especially when leaf out has occurred. We try to confirm each other's sightings. It's sometimes difficult to tell the others where to look. But last week, the feather you see in the middle of this photo helped us a little. See if you can find the nest. It is at about eight o'clock from the feather. 
Looks like Laura found it. Hopefully the rest of you have too. This isn't a nest and it isn't a heron, but it illustrates really well the difficulty of trying to observe after leaf out has occurred. Look very carefully right in the center of this photo taken by Sue Ayler a few weeks ago at March Point, and you'll see hidden among the maple leaves a mature bald eagle with his eyes seemingly closed. Maybe it's napping? Hard to spot, isn't it? Observing has taught us a bit of heron speak as we use our ears to help identify the different stages of the breeding and nesting season. Breeding behaviors, one of which you're looking at in this photo, are accompanied by the loud clacking of beats a beaks <laughs> and a multitude of bizarre other out of this world kind of sounds. Incubating herons emit a soft murmur. It's a kind of a muted growl. For me, it's a comforting kind of sound. Um, when a heron flies over an occupied nest or sometimes when herons pass one another in flight, we will hear a single loud cluck or a soft bark. Because we can't see into the nest, listening is how we identify when hatching has occurred. Newborns, like the ones in this photo, emit a very muted version of what you're now about to hear. This is the sound of one month olds demanding food. So I'm not hearing it. Um, I don't know if that means Laura hasn't pushed the audio. Um, here they are. Noisy, aren't they? They're audible from the road, the parking lot, and the landfill. We also keep track of disturbances to the heronry, including predators. We listen for the presence of the eagles, even when we can't see them. This is typical eagle chat. <laughs> Actually, yeah, go ahead, that's it. So that was typical eagle chat. And here are the screaming sounds of an extremely disturbed heron. That's a sound that we don't like to hear. It's a sound that is sometimes followed by herons flushing from their nests and chaotically circling above the heronry. It is often associated with eagle predation. Bald eagles uh, often nest in or near heronries. The March Point heronry was home to a single eagle nest for many years. This past winter, that eagle nest blew down. Amazingly, within a couple of weeks, the eagles had constructed not just one, but two new nests. Here they are. The one on the left side of the photo has a bald eagle perched above it. The other nest is on the right side of the photo. Eagles eat heron eggs, heron young, and the occasional adult heron but herons also benefit when a pair of eagles nest in the heronry. Nesting eagles defend their territory, driving away other eagles, thus minimizing the number of eagles feasting on young heron um, in the heronry. The eagles seem to have an interesting relationship with the bald eagles. When 
I'm sorry, the herons <laughs> seem to have an interesting relationship with the bald eagles. When, they're, when the herons are not defending their young from the eagles, we often see herons and eagles roosting together on the treetops at March Point. This photo was taken by Shirley Ho just a few days ago at March Point. The eagle is perched above his nest and seven herons are just hanging out on the neighboring sna snag. What do you think? They look pretty companionable, don't they? Community science volunteers enable the trust to monitor the health of the heronry. We also provide data that documents and preserves local knowledge. And in turn, that knowledge helps the trust protect the March Point heronry. This season, we have focused on the relationship between the herons and the March Point landfill. The March Point landfill is directly across the road from the heronry. If um, you look at the photo, in the middle of the photo is the forest where the March Point Heronry is located. Across the road to the right of the forest, you can see a brown area with a green shed, a lagoon that sits between the berm with the railroad tracks, and an area with greenish shrubs and plants. The March Point landfill site consists of the brownish area, the lagoon, and the shrubby area. It is a contaminated brownfield site that is scheduled for cleanup in 2023. That is a cleanup that is absolutely needed to improve the health of Padilla Bay. And the cleanup of Padilla Bay will in turn improve the health of the herons who forage there. However, the catch is that the timing of the cleanup must be done in a way that doesn't disturb breeding and nesting herons. That's where the data we collect can be used to protect the herons. The herons use the landfill area itself throughout the breeding and nesting season. The season begins with staging, which is a gathering of herons outside the heronry before they re-enter the colony each year for breeding and nesting. Staging at March Point takes place on the Phil Islands along the Swinomish Channel and on the railroad tracks adjacent to the landfill site. In early March this year, we actually counted over a hundred herons staging on the railroad tracks next to the landfill. This is Sue Ehlers' photo of that happening. Any cleanup activities occurring during staging could result in the herons abandoning the March Point heronry. The herons also hang out on the railroad tracks throughout the season and uh, wait there uh, for the tides to change. Our yearly monitoring report on the March Point season documents the dates, locations, and number of herons we see staging, as well as their use of the railroad tracks throughout the season. Herons gather sticks for building and reinforcing their nests. They gather them from trees within the heronry, from abandoned nests in the heronry, from trees along March Point Road, from the Phil Islands, and from the landfill itself. This photo taken by Shirley Ho documents the herons gathering sticks on the landfill site. We record the location, date, and number of herons we see gathering sticks. We count and record the number of flying herons we see carrying sticks. We have documented that stick gathering takes place throughout much of the nesting season as herons reinforce their nests as the chicks grow. The chicks remain in the nest until they are almost the size of adult herons. This photo of a heron with a stick in its bill 
preparing to do some remodeling, reinforcing, was taken by Sue Ayler on June 2nd this year. Shirley Ho says, if you want to know where to spot herons foraging, follow the tides. And she is right, herons are waders. Their long legs allow them to fish with the changing tides. Herons frequently forage in the channel between the shoreline of the landfill and the fill islands. This photo taken by Sue Ayler shows 140 heron foraging on the mud flats across from T. Bailey adjacent to the landfill channel. Any disturbance of the herons while foraging here could interfere with the feeding of the chicks whose caloric needs are very high. Newborn chicks only weigh about two ounces. In two months, they reach adult size, four feet tall, a wingspan of six feet, and a weight of almost five pounds. That growth is dependent on a steady supply of fish during those two months. The herons fly over the landfill site when heading out to forage and when returning with food for the young. This year, we are documenting their use of the airspace above the site. Any cleanup activities that could cause the herons to change their flight pattern might disrupt necessary and timely feeding of the growing chicks. This photo by Shirley Ho shows just a single heron flying directly over the landfill site, heading back to the heronry. But at the nadir of low tide, we often see large nest exchanges take place as the returning herons re-enter the heronry and their nesting partners fly out to forage. On May 25th, we actually counted 200 herons in a single nest exchange using the airspace above the landfill. This photo by Sue Ayler taken just a few days ago captures about a hundred herons approaching the landfill airspace as they return to the heronry. Every day I'm at March Point, I appreciate how lucky we are to have the largest heronry in the Salish Sea here in Skagit County. And I appreciate how lucky the herons are that Skagit Land Trust has protected their home. March Point is unique. There are not many places left with a forest of trees tall enough and strong enough to support multiple heron nests 150 feet above the ground. There are not many places left with a mature coastal forest adjacent to the extraordinary eelgrass beds of Padilla Bay. Eelgrass beds that are home to the fish herons need if their young are to survive. What the March Point herons don't have is room for their colony to expand. The property that you will hear Molly talk about next would provide the March Point herons with that needed extra room. That's why the Land Trust is making purchase of that property a priority. I hope you will support that effort. What better way to close than with some fun photos of herons making friends. Thanks to Shirley Ho for these herons with their pelican pals and to Sue Ayler for this two-year-old heron looking to make some friends and joining them for dinner. So that's it. And now Molly. Thank you, Anne. That was just great. And I, I really want to thank and note that Anne and Shirley Ho and Sue Ayler and Matt Kirschenbaum, who's also on, on the phone and his volunteers for the foraging monitoring program do amazing work. Right now, some of these people are out there every week or more 
observing the heron so that we get good data so that we can keep up um, science-based decisions regarding this and other herons, heronry. So really appreciate that. And I want to thank you all for coming tonight so that you learn more about this heronry and the heronries in Skagit County. Next slide. So the Skagit Land Trust involvement at March Point began in 1994, but the heronry itself had been at March Point since at least the 1950s. And of course, at that time, there's a lot more forest than you see in that upper picture. In the 1950s and probably up to the 1970s, there were many small to mid-sized heronries around Puget Sound. Um, and it, in fact, that this heronry, which is now uh, a very significant heronry, 40 to 50 nests were counted in 1984, which were, was um, considered a, a moderate sized heronry. 3.5 acres were donated to Skagit Land Trust. This was our actual, our first fee land donation, our first land donation to the Land Trust by Bud and Vera Kinney. And it's that green sort of heart-shaped parcel. And at that time, beside it, there was a gravel pit and there was a sawmill across the road. And as I look at this old photo, it looks like there was actually a, a gravel road maybe on March Point. Mr. Kinney said, I thought it was best for the conservation group to own it. Some people might not leave the herons alone. And he was absolutely right. A lot of people don't understand heron needs and um, it was very smart of him. And, and he was an early adopter. I mean, that was almost 30 years ago, so. So fast forward, this is now the largest great blue heron nesting colony on the west coast of the United States. Amazing growth. And since that time, there are 700 nests as compared to the potentially 40 or 50 that were counted just 25 or 30 years ago. It is speculated that many of the small and mid-sized, or actually 40 years ago, many of the mid-sized heronries were lost as development happens in Puget Sound, and they started to congregate into mega colonies like March Point, and March Point has become the mega of the mega colonies. So why do herons nest here? When you look at those pictures, it's a pretty bizarre place to decide to make a large heron nesting area. Well, this is fantastic heron real estate. Even though it's in the midst of the industrial area for Anacortes, it truly is isolated. It's up a steep hill and you can see those are volunteers that are doing heron monitoring, climbing up that uh, hill in the winter to count nests and very steep. Once you get up there, you get into a sea of nettles that are waist high or bigger in most seasons. There are numerous types of trees. Most of them are quite tall, which herons need and older. And as Anne said, there is, uh, traditionally there was a resident pair of eagles, but it sounds like now there are two resident <laughs> pair of eagles. But the most important aspect is the proximity to Bedilla, Fidalgo and Smilk Bays and the eelgrass, eelgrass beds that are there for foraging. This is really what is critical. I think many of you know that um, Padilla Bay is the largest contiguous eelgrass bay in the lower 48 states. So it's extremely important. If you were a heron, you want to nest beside there because all of their seven preferred fishes that they like to eat when they are nesting are associated with eelgrass beds. Thus, the site is actually incredibly well selected uh, from a heron's point of view. And the site is that little red dot on both photos on the left hand side. Um, you can see it there with Padilla Bay in the upper right hand corner. And then on the right hand side, all of those green areas are areas of eelgrass beds in Skagit County. So you can see that they've really centralized themselves to where the eelgrass are. The other thing that's important is that they're on top of a hill that no one can get into, literally no one. We don't even go in there when the herons are nesting. And Highway 20 provides some white noise. So if there are other sounds around there, they're moderated by the white noise of Highway 20, especially in the summer when the leaves are on the trees. So here is a, um, another schematic just to show that. And it shows uh, the triangle, the yellow triangle is the property that we'll be talking about further tonight. And the blue is what we've already protected. And then it shows the different bays around there and the Anacortes industrial area which is where the herons have decided to situate themselves. Our property is actually zoned for manufacturing and industrial that the herons live on. 
So March Point is critically important to maintaining healthy heron populations in the Salish Sea. It is two to three times larger than any other heronry in Puget Sound or the Sagic Sea, or even along the west coast of the United States. That sheer number of herons breeding, nesting, and rearing their young at March Point provides a genetic diversity necessary to sustain healthy populations of great blue herons in the Salish Sea. One thing that is interesting to us and that is often hard um, to convince people that don't understand herons is that herons at March Point are really sensitive to human intrusions. Despite the fact they're in a heavy manufacturing area, they are on a forested hill that is completely off limits to humans. They are well documented to be, to be nervous when people approach them and they flush whenever someone comes near their nests. And Washington Fish and Wildlife recommends large forested buffers for colonies like this, where herons exhibit behaviors indicative of low tolerance for, for um, people regardless of the setting. There are 700 to 750 nests right now at March Point. Each of those nests has two parents and two to four chicks. That means there's 3,000 500 herons right now nesting in that little area on that hill in the industrial area of March Point. So in 2002, this heronry was threatened and in part it's because almost no one knew it was there. And many of you probably were around to follow this. Um, uh, heavy manufacturing plant was proposed for next door and it took um, we had many partners helped us out and it took about a year to a year and a half. And in the end, we signed an MOU with T. Bailey Inc., who is a manufacturing plant. They do um, uh, steel manufacturing uh, of different types. And we have a great relationship with them. They employ annual and seed, we, we have gotten together and employ annual and seasonal buffers as recommended by heron biologists around the heron. So they can do certain things when the herons aren't there and certain other things when the herons are there. They do sound monitoring and nesting uh, and do seasonal monitoring of the nesting of the nesting herons if they're going to have a new activity before the city of Anacortes um, um, gives them permits and it worked really well. They're a great partner and they're a great neighbor. And part of the deal was that they donated a conservation easement to Skagit Land Trust of the upper part of their property. That's in blue in the map right there. And interestingly enough, the herons have started to nest on that property as well. So um, one of the reasons this heronry is so secure is that uh, T. Bailey has a very steep hill beside their heronry and they have actually built us a trail up to the heronry in the off season so that we can um, so that we can monitor it, but otherwise the area is fenced off. Next slide. So Skagit Land Trust also has conservation interests in two other heronries in Skagit County. One is the Barney Lake heronry, which is interesting. Barney Lake is freshwater, not marine waters. It's, it's not a very big heronry, um, 20 to 30 nests. It's right near Big Rock and they actually feed on freshwater fish. The other is the recently abandoned Samish Island heronry. This heronry, located for about 100 years where the triangle is, was abandoned during the nesting season in 2017. It had been occupied, as I said, for almost 100 years. Fish and Wildlife said that great blue herons can return up to their heronries for up to 10 years after abandonment, so we manage this area as welcoming for herons. We are also seeking to conserve as much of the forest around the heronry as possible. And of course, many other projects are going on in this area. Uh, on the map to the right, what you can notice is that many of you helped us protect the Samish flower farm three years ago. We have a conservation easement on the forest above it, which is actually where the heron, the former heronry is. And then recently down below is a Samish Island gateway or conservation project, which we I know we had numerous uh, donors that are on the call tonight, help us protect. So there's almost 90 acres there protected uh, for many reasons. And uh, if the herons return, they'll benefit. But what's going on with herons in Skagit County? Because things have certainly changed. Well, in, there was a huge concern by many of us in 2017, when that almost 100 year old heronry on Samish Island abandoned mid season. 
uh, it shook us. And although we don't know exactly what the cause is, and we don't think it's one cause in particular, it gives us good guidance on what we need to do to protect our local heronies. So this is the size of the chicks when the herons abandon their nest. And you know that herons and birds don't abandon chicks of this size. They absolutely can't take care of themselves. So something big happened, some significant stressor, and we don't know what it was. So was it eagles? And we'll talk a little bit more about eagles um, and the rebound of eagles. One of the things about eagles is that since they have rebounding, things that might not have been a big deal to a heron flushing off a nest 25 years ago are now because there are more eagles in the area. Was it loud, unusual noises at the wrong time? Uh, people observed that there was metal being cut up cars being cut up across the road, there was new housing going in, there's all sorts of things going on. It's, it's an urbanizing area. So there are just noises that herons might not have been used to. That was a year when there were a lot of fires and vapors from um, off gassing, but also just from um, people burning fires on their property. And that mimics forest fires for, for herons. So could they have thought there was a forest fire? Was it low flying drones? Is it the overall loss of the forested buffer in that area or some combination of all of the above? We'll never know. But one thing we do know is that we're urbanizing. And this um, map shows in 1972, the light green areas were um, areas that held over 50% forest cover. In 1996, 25 years ago, you can see the change. That's 25 years ago. Certainly we know that has changed a lot since now. So we are losing large low elevation forest blocks at an astounding rate, especially on shoreline, and those are what herons need. And what happens is that one house 30 years ago becomes many houses, and then the trees are cut down for views, and then they're developed, and then the storms come in and they blow down some more trees, and then of course the shoreline starts to um, go inwards, and so they have to um, Rip wrap it, and then there's parties and docks and kids and whatever. It's normal living. It's Puget Sound. It's what happens. But it makes it harder for herons to find sanctuaries to live. So we're really determined to protect those. So a really interesting fact about herons and the eagles is that the eagles are no longer on the endangered species list. It's a huge success story because of the ban on DDT and because of the Endangered Species Act. So after 40 years, they're no longer on it. But with more, eagle, more eagles, and surely if you've been on the Samish Flats, you have seen the numerous amounts of eagles out there in the winter. If herons are flushed off their nests for other reasons, the consequences for herons can be greater. So it's just a, a different season, different time. So what herons need to be successful and what heronries need they need mixed forest area that are at least 10 acres. And I would say 10 acres is a minimum. They need far bigger than that. And they need to be right beside productive marine tidelines. And those are Samish Bay, Fadilla Bay, Fidalgo Bay, places with eelgrass. Otherwise, they'll be like wearing like 20 to 25. But if you want them to grow, they have to have that food source. They need to be set aside from humans, pets, unusual nights, unusual lights, pollution, noises during the February to August season. That needs to be a really quiet sanctuary time. They need protection from predators, and we've talked about the one eagle theory, and they need protection from frequent storm events, which are happening more frequently because of climate change. So we can do something about one and two, not a whole lot we can do as about three and four, but we must focus on number one and two. And we are, and that's why we have asked you to come here tonight so that we can talk to you about an opportunity to protect 3.5 more acres. And I know that seems small, but in the world of heron reef, it's massive. On March Point, you can see on this map, our protected land is in blue. It's both the conservation easement and land we own and manage. The white line is the current heron nesting area right there. They do move around the hilltop, but that's where they currently are. And the 2021 purchase is what we have an opportunity to buy if by August 1st. And then we will have 15 acres at the top of the hill, which is a mixture of both the heron nesting area and the forested buffer. This is just showing it up 
closer, the um, Snow Mountain and Hillstead is actually the um, uh, old dump site that's being cleaned up that Anne was talking about. And as you can see, we're right across the road from that. And uh, you can see T. Bailey up in the upper left-hand corner. So what are the threats if we aren't able to protect this property? I mean, the bottom line is that any activity this close to this heronry could be catastrophic. They, they do not tolerate disturbance. They never have, and they've been there a long time, and they're there because it's a quiet place. So the primary threat to this heronry is tree clearing or development of the property that would impact the heronry and possibly lead to its abandonment. abandonment. And view properties like this are sought after, and we'll show you a slide of what this could be. Even if you couldn't build a house on it, and it's hard to for cities in the county to turn down um, a development lot, but even if you couldn't, people could clear for the views or for a recreation lot. There could We couldn't control what went on in that property. And there's not a lot of force left, as you can see on that hillside, and we need to protect everything we can. Next slide. So that is a view from the top of the property. And as you can see, if the trees are cleared, it's a view property. You can see Mount Baker, it's pretty. Um, if we do not buy it, it would sell immediately. So an investment in the future of the heronry. The landowner has given us, we did an appraisal, they accepted it. They really would like to see it protected for herons. And so they're selling it to us for a little over $70,000. $25,000, $800 still needs to be raised by August 1st for this land purchase. And any funds raised above that amount will go to our Great Blue Heron Fund for stewardship. This conservation area is probably per acre the most expensive of all our conservation areas to manage. We spend, it's only you know, a little over 12 acres, hopefully will be 15. We spend two to $5,000 a year on stewardship, public policy, education, and the Ivor Heron, Ivor Heronry, which I'll explain in a minute, a camera project. And the stewardship you, Anne, talked about a little bit in the community science, public policy is making sure that the decision makers understand the needs of the herons and thus can make public policies and regulations around heronry so that we can protect them not just his, this heronry but other heronries around the county and education we we after we had the um uh near miss i would call it with uh, t bailey uh 20 15 to 20 years ago we decided that the best thing we can do is educate people about this heronry and the eye of the heronry allows people to see the herons nesting without actually go in the heronry so every year we raise the stewardship money. And this is just a few pictures of the scientists, the citizen uh, community scientists doing the heron monitoring. We tag every tree. We have long histories of how many nests are in every tree. We have incredible volunteers that help us with um, technical systems at the Mark Point Heron. And the camera is a really exciting project. We've had a camera of one sort or another in the heronry for quite a while. We don't have one in there currently, but um, we are going to put in multiple cameras with a solar system this fall. And I just want to recognize a few people because I think some of them are on the phone. Um, Quantum Construction is going to host um, us beaming it across 20 so that people can see the herons in real time, like that picture over on the right hand side of those cute chicks. Ian Woofington is a solar expert, has been giving a ton of in-kind solar expertise. Shell Puget Sound Refinery helped with the cost to actually get the cameras in the system. Horizon Audio and Video is, is just wonderful in uh, making this whole system come together because the, we're not on the grid here. So trying to figure out how to host a, a website off the grid um, is difficult. And then our members and many foundations also contributed to this project. So we're really excited to have that go online in the fall. So how you can help Great Blue Herons is to consider making a gift to our Great Blue Heron Fund through one of these options. You could go to our website and make a gift through the donation button and just put Heronry in your comment section so that we know that your gift is for the Great Blue Heron Fund and this project. You could mail in a check um, again, please put Heronry in the memo line. And there was an envelope in the most recent newsletter, but any check, any check, and any envelope will do. And then uh, we have seen um, an increase in donor advised funds, stock, QCDs from IRAs, and those are great options. We accept them all. And we'd be very grateful. 
So I'm going to turn this back over to Laura so that we can do a question and answer because we've gone through a lot and we would really love to um, hear what your thoughts are and questions you have. Laura? Yes, that would help if I unmuted myself, <laughs> wouldn't it? Um, so thank you, Molly. Uh, I am going to go through right now, and uh, I think I've asked you all to unmute, and I'm going to go through and uh, ask you if you'd like to start your video. I've been monitoring the chat. I haven't seen too much in there right at the moment, um, but if anybody out there has a question, please feel free to, um, to speak up as I go through and try to get all of your videos started, if you want to start your video. And I think we do also have uh, Stacy Dahl on the call. She can, if anybody has any questions about, um, uh, about the camera, she has been working on that uh, from our staff. So I see a question here, Laura. It says, who owns that section of property between between the property for sale and Skagit Land Trust. Uh, that is a private landowner, and at uh, this time they don't have an interest in selling, but there is a um, deed restriction on the part of the property that hosts the heron nest. Um, uh, so that part of the forest that actually hosts the heron nest that is- my question. I have a question. This is Linda. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I, I have a question about the recordings of these. Is there a way that we can like just post them on our social media so that other people can know about it too? Because that was a pretty great video. Uh, the presentation was really great. And it's a lovely night out. And I think people might have found other things to do. So it would be really nice to get it out to others. So the question is, will there be a video that we can post on social media? Yes, yes. As soon as we finish this evening, um, I will be um, processing this video and then I will have it up on the website uh, tomorrow and I will share that link out. Great, thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, Sue. Yeah. Okay, once the uh, cameras, the solar cameras are set up in the heronry, um, where will they feed to? Where, where will they be uh, monitored from? Now, Stacy so, answer that, right? Stacy's here. <laughs> well, we, we have a relationship with um, Quantum Construction that will host the server. And then the intention is that it will be um, available on our website. So you can watch it on our website. Sure. <laughs> Will it be going year round or just during the breeding season or what, what are the operating, what's the operating schedule on that? Well, definitely during the breeding season, um, February through the end of July. Um, you know, we'd like to keep it longer, but there's not a lot that's going on once the birds have, have left the nests. Right. Right. I see a question, will there be protections or timing noise restrictions put in place when the landfill construction begins to help protect the, to protect the heron? Anyone want to talk about that? <laughs> um, so uh, we are uh, working with the company that is going to be doing the landfill cleanup. Um, they are required um, before they do any cleanup that they develop a heronry management plan. And that has to include in it mitigation for any activities they might be doing that are disturbing to the herons. We are, um, we have repeated many times that uh, the activities would best be done uh, during the off season. So from September to February, um, we have met with the um, biologists from the company who are, who will be creating their heron remanagement plan. And we've 
um, showing them where we observe from. We've um, they have set up uh, noise monitors so they'll be able to get baseline uh, noise recordings. Um, and um, I feel that as long as we are able to remain in good communication with them, that hopefully we will be able to um, to have the cleanup done because it is absolutely necessary that it be done. Um, to be done in a way that will not, and at a time, that will not disturb the herons. Do you have more to say about that, Molly, or? No, I think you did a great job. So, Anne, there's a question in the chat. Um, when the chicks fledge, do they stay in their birthing colony? Uh, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> I may ask for Sue Ayler for a little help with this. We have, um, spent uh, time after they have fledged uh, trying to figure out where they go. Um, it's particularly interesting to think about where do they go to learn to feed because all of a sudden they are out of that nest and they have to learn how to catch fish uh, for themselves. Um, and Sue is really good at observing young herons who are learning to forage. Um, two years ago, they actually foraged uh, in the lagoon that's right next to the casino. And at that time, we would um, see them there in large numbers and they would often have a few adult herons in there with them. And then last year, they didn't use that lagoon. Um, we saw them uh, by the uh, refinery piers um, again, with large numbers of young herons and uh, a few adults. Um, the foraging team that Sue and uh, Shirley Ho and Matt Kirschbaum are pot part of um, are looking so far out at the herons that when they're looking at the herons foraging far away, they can't easily identify how many of those herons are um, our young are our, our just fledged herons. We do know, um, and the picture of the two-year-old heron that was looking at the ducks at the end um, confirms that they do come back. They come back to March Point Heronry, um, at least some young herons, some one-year-old, two-year-old herons do. Um, Sue, do you have more to add or Matt or Shirley? I would like to add a little bit about right after they fledge, um, they take off and maybe for a day or two, they may come back to the nest, um, but it's not very long. Evidently the juveniles like to go find a different roosting place somewhat near the heronry, but, and it seems to have changed over the years. Um, oh gosh, maybe six, seven years ago, it was, a little bit to the northwest uh, around North Texas Road. Another year it was up by on top of the, uh, the big green uh, fuel uh, tanks up at the north end of March Point. You look up and you'll see several hundred herons lining the perimeter of the top of the, the tank. And they just seem to like that anyway uh, for a while after, after they fledged. So let's say they, they don't come back to the nest after two or three days. So what they have to do is they learn from the adults about how to forage. Uh, the parents do not feed them. So they have to pay quick attention. And if you, if you look out and you can see closely enough, you can see that they're intermixed with the adults over the foraging grounds and they do a pretty good job of it. Um, there's some thought that once the uh, breeding season's over and herons disperse because the, uh, the prey availability is, is diminished as the se as, uh, breeding season finishes. And it's thought that some of the juveniles will follow some of the adults up to the uplands, which is where a lot of the adults go to uh, hunt for voles. So they have to learn how to hunt for uh, small mammals too. Um, as far as coming back the next year, yeah, it isn't like you get a whole slug of new ones. It's, it's hard to survive, but they do come back. And we've seen that in the nest study actually this year, looking up in the heronry when some of the 
adults who've just roosting, there's intermixed juveniles. So they're kind of, it's it's kind of a tough deal when you fledge, but they, they tend to make it. <laughs> I um, just just one little um, thing to add is that um, I think statistically it's been shown that only about 25% of herons actually survive that first year. Um, so as Sue said, it's tough being a young heron. Hmm. Yeah. And okay, there's lots of great questions here in the chat. Uh, just one that I can answer. Um, yes, how will you be keeping us aware of the fundraising and how it's progressing? Uh, we're going to be sending out, you know, we send out about weekly or bi-weekly uh, e-news reports, and we will definitely be letting everyone know um, as we get closer to the deadline uh, when we're able to successfully, uh, hopefully successfully purchase this property. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that you'll be seeing emails probably from me um, and our weekly or bi-weekly ones. Some great questions in here. Um, I can, I'll, I'll tackle the fireworks, but I would be interested to know if other people yeah. have that. Um, so those fireworks have been going off for decades there. And so when you're a little heron, the, that's a common sound. It's a, you actually know, oh, somehow you know it, or your parents know, and they're not frightened. If there are new unusual sounds, they could be quite frightened, but that's a, uh, a continuous sound so it's it so far I, I would think if they truly expanded a lot it would be a big deal but the fireworks at this point in time the fireworks can't stand to not bother them and yes the railroad tracks um are active and um but they're they're for the um uh oil going in and out of the refineries and then there's um one another question here about the at the march point heronry site and then of course the landfill cleanup um, I don't know, Anne, if you were able, do we know exactly how long the cleanup is expected to take and to get to completion? I, my understanding is that it will be completed all in one season. Um, so uh, depending on when they begin it, uh, it'll be done that year. Fair hope. Yeah. There's a great observation here that there are some new heronries being established at Ship Harbor. Will they have an effect on this heronry? And I'm not sure who- million dollar question. Because when you think about March Point having 40 to 50 and then now having 700, you do have to wonder where are the heronries of the future? And I don't know the eelgrass feeding area around Ship Harbor, so I don't know if that, that, that foraging is so important to them. And of course they want to minimize how much energy it takes to get to the foraging area. So I don't know much, but I do know there is a, a, a heron reforming at Ship Harbor that's been off and on there. Do any of you know about the Ship Harbor heronry? I could add a few things to that. Um, it's uh, just recently we've found about four nests and there's probably a few more way back in the bushes. Uh, it took a while to find them, but um, been able to verify that at least three of them have adults that are incubating. There's, they have the right profile for sitting on the, the nest, so something's going on. Um, as far as the foraging availability, um, it does look like Skyline, there's a, a couple nests in a, in a tree in Skyline right now too, but it does look like those herons fly over at least to Fidago Bay or March Point Heronry, it's actually about the same distance from Ship Point to March Point as it was from March Point to Samish Island. And mm -hmm. we knew that the Samish herons would fly over to, you know, munch on whatever's over at March uh, Point and vice versa. So it's a distance, but it's a, a distance that looks like it's being utilized. So March Point is the whole eelgrass, it's contributing tremendously to whatever's gonna happen at Ship Harbor. Um, as I say, there there are a few nests that we found over there. And I uh, guess last year there was one, this year we're seeing four, maybe more. Uh, so who knows, who knows how long that's gonna continue for. Looks like Matt, Matt, do you have it, Matt Kirschenbaum? Did you have something you were gonna pipe up about? I, I, just, grabbed, I just grabbed the most recent uh, foraging data for Ship Harbor, and there was like 17 herons foraging right out. There's a heavy uh, public use along that beach. Uh, 
when they forage, a lot of people don't want to sit in their car, want their dogs to walk, and they come down on the beach. So I'm sure we'd have even more foraging. I just ran downstairs. I'm out of breath to get my full. <laughs> so that the uh, the uh, the folks that are doing that survey over there report that there's a significant amount of disturbance, even though dogs are supposed to be on the leash and uh, summertime is going to pick that up. But uh, the most recent count, I think he had 17 was the high for uh, foraging during that two hour period. The last survey uh, was done on uh, June 10th. So okay. they'll be doing another one very shortly. Uh, just a, a short word. Uh, uh, this survey starts in mid-April, right on tax day, April 15th or the old tax day, not with COVID. And uh, the every two weeks, we survey six sites uh, for foraging herons, counting them in four um, half hour periods and documenting behavior and inter any interactions they have with other wildlife, especially eagles and other mm -hmm. things like that, and humans. And uh, the six sites are Ship Harbor, the Tommy Thompson Trail, the center of Fenogo Bay. Uh, we call it Cowgill, but it's not far from the, the March Point Heronry. And that looks out over the west side of the Squamish Channel. And then the east side of the Squamish Channel is viewed from Bay, Bay View. And those are enormous distances, uh, but up to six, 700 herons have been counted from some of those sites in Padilla Bay at a time in one period, one half hour period. Uh, the next site is uh, north of us. We used to do Alice Bay, but with the, the loss of the uh, Samish Island heronry, uh, there, there was some different use there, significantly lower. And, and Ann uh, Isinger, who is our con biological consultant, suggested we look for another site and then monitor Alice a little bit periodically. Uh, so we're now doing, uh, I think it's, uh, we call it erratic landing. That's our site. And it's halfway down the south shore of Samish Island. And then the Blau Oyster is another, is that sixth site. And we're exploring the West 90, the state wildlife area, uh, as a possibility, which was not far from the, the new uh, land trust acquisition on Samish Island. So uh, some 16, 17 folks uh, do this. Uh, anybody ever interested, just get in touch with me. We'd be happy to have another citizen science scientist help us. Thanks a lot. Could, could I add one more thing about Ship Harbor? Um, as far as numbers of herons, like Matt was talking about 17 during a, a foraging survey. Um, today I went out and in the uh, inner wetland area along the perimeter, there's a tree where the herons like to roost and I counted uh, 26 were, were roosting there. And just adjacent to that spot is where the nests are. So, you know, I don't know exactly how many nests are, how many of those roosting herons are specifically associated with ship harbor nests, but at least it's definitely showing some pretty decent uh, heron activity in that area. It seems important. So. Looks like we have another, that's sort of a good, um, thank you for a plug for the foraging program. And it looks like someone had a, a great point uh, about Samish Island. It seems so much quieter. It's bizarre that they moved next to Highway 20, but uh, I'm sure Molly or Anne could speak to that, that it's sort of what, you know, where you've grown up and, and that, that white noise of Highway 20, right? Well, in the for, I mean, yeah, I, I live on Samish Island and um, remember we've just been protecting all that property in the last three years. Before that we had 15 acres protected and so you had um, all sorts of things going on <laughs> on that one property, including it's a it's actually a interesting corner kind of accidents. And then there you're, it was right by the road, so there'd be like you know um, ambulances and stuff with sirens. And so it was actually a fairly it it wasn't as rural. You get on top of that hill beside T Bailey, and it is quiet. It's amazing, and you're right in the middle. And I know Stacy goes out there a lot. It, it's just really remarkable how quiet it is. So um, I know it, it does seem kind of bizarre, but we're hopeful they'll return to Samish and we are doing everything we can uh, to make sure the forest is there for them. Certainly the feeding grounds are there and we actually are hoping to protect another forest on Samish 
that is also next to the Samish Bay foraging, just so that we have places for the herons to go. Are there any other questions um, about the community science efforts, about this expansion project? Well, I want to thank you all so much for taking an hour out of this gorgeous evening uh, to spend with us to learn more about Great Blue Herons here in Skagit and uh, the work Skagit Land Trust and many other organizations are doing to ensure that there will be Great Blue Herons here for generations to come. Um, you can always email us with any questions. Like I said, this recording will be available um, tomorrow. And uh, Molly or Anne, do you have any final words? Um, I just, we have several resources. If you really want to learn more about herons, um, contact Laura. We have uh, a few things. Here, here are three um, recommendations. If you haven't, if you're really interested in heron and you haven't uh, read these yet or gotten in touch, uh, the middle one is by Ann Isinger, who Matt mentioned, and she's also our biological, she does biological oversight for all of our community scientists. And that's it. Even though it's dated, it's a, Super report. The Great Blue Heron by Robert Butler is just, he's a great writer, so it's a very easy read that just, it has good pictures, it just talks about Great Blue Herons. And then on the right is the, it's the publication that dictates um, how we can live with Great Blue Herons here in Puget Sound. And it's what we use and what we ask the county, well, it's actually in the county's uh, curricular ordinance to use, and it's what the city of Anacortes uses, it's what all the ordinances are built on, so it's got really good data about how you actually live alongside Great Blue Herons. So those are three resources that uh, we recommend. And I guess in closing, I would just like to thank all of you for caring about Great Blue Herons as much as we do. It makes yes. a difference. You're here. <laughs> all right, well then um, we're gonna close things up. Thank you all so much for coming and uh, we hope to see you at an event someday in the future. We will be having our open house on Samish Island on July 31st. You can visit our website, skagitlandtrust.org to learn more about that. And we're gonna be trying to do tours through the new uh, trails in the uplands and then down to the beach. Um, so we really hope that you'll come join us out on the land this summer. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.